Aloha, my name is Dave Mitchell. I'm with Employee Assistance of the Pacific, and I appreciate your interest in this important topic. Uh, I have a lot of information to share with you about what we have seen in Hawaii's largest EAP this first year of coronavirus. Uh, again, a lot of information about how this pandemic has affected the mental health, substance abuse, and well being of Hawaii employees. In addition, I'll be sharing some perspectives from our 200 EAP customers, as well as some guesses about what might be ahead for this next year two of this global pandemic. Serving over 200 Hawaii-based businesses from every industry, we have had a heck of a year, and I know a lot of you have as well. So a lot to share in 40 minutes, so fasten your seatbelts, here we go. I have a pretty strong background in disaster mental health. I was the clinical director for a crisis response team in Washington State for over a decade, responded to many incidents uh, and traumas along the way. I volunteered to do disaster mental health with, with the American Red Cross and supervised teams of counselors at the World Trade Center and for victims of Hurricane Katrina and for Florida tornadoes. And then running three EAPs in my career, I've responded to a lot of workplace traumas along the way. The one thing all of these disasters seem to have in common is that they have a beginning, a middle, and an end. The coronavirus, on the other hand, has changed everything. Half a million people have died. We just can't wrap our heads around that number. It's been going on a year now. Uh, it's changed a lot of what we do. We have lost well-established businesses, entire industries have shut down. We can't travel, we can't have lunch with our coworkers. We're working from home more than we used to. And we've spent the last year being afraid of something we can't even see. I'll show you what we typically see at the beginning of any large-scale disaster as people begin to process the event and the stresses of the event. This may help you understand the variety of reactions that you may have seen in the early stages of this event. Hans Selye's work focused on how the body reacts to the stress of a major event. He identified three stages, which he called the alarm phase, the resistance phase, and the exhaustion phase. When hit by a stressor in general, we tend to keep steady for a bit while we're in disbelief. We can't wrap our head around it. Then we dip down into fear and anxiety in a shock phase before rising up with resistance and resilience where our body meets the challenge of the stress. And that's followed by the exhaustion stage where the stress begins to subside and we need to take care of ourselves so we don't bottom out. The good news here is that there's another stage. Uh, eventually we all start the process of recovery from every disaster and this one will be no exception. After we have adapted to a disaster or a death or a tragedy or even a global pandemic, we start the process of recovery that looks something like this curve. It's not an easy, steady climb back up and there are often bumps, especially for a death or disaster around the one year anniversary, but most of us do recover. And check out the red baseline here. Most of us end up somehow climbing to a higher level of functioning than we were at before. And we've learned what helps people do better over time during the recovery phase. It's called bounded optimism. We have learned that too much hope too early doesn't help people. That's the red line here. You tell people the virus will go away like magic and people feel hopeful, then let down. We learned this from the military. It's called the Stockdale Paradox. U.S. Navy Vice Admiral James Stockdale was a prisoner in Vietnam when he was a captain. His challenge was to communicate to his fellow prisoners a sense of hope in a difficult situation. He later said that those who felt they'd be home by Christmas didn't do as well mentally as those who understood and adjusted to that it might take longer. Many of his fellow prisoners later credited his message of optimism tended by real, tempered by realism with helping them survive. Now, I was thrilled and relieved to get my two vaccine shots. It was a huge relief, but I've had to temper that with that this isn't over yet, and there are even new variants that we don't understand. And as more people get vaccinated, one concern is that people will start feeling, yay, it's over, and then the numbers will go up again. We still don't know how long the virus will last or what happens to the 5% that the vaccine doesn't work for. Now it's important to stay optimistic, but the better 
term to a better approach here is that bounded optimism which leads to a better outcome. It means inspiration, hope, and optimism that's tempered by reality. Approaching this second year and the fatigue we're all feeling with bounded optimism may help you and others do better. The hope is that we eventually get to a much safer place when more people are vaccinated. But even then, it's going to take time for people to process what has happened to their lives because of this crazy year. And the tricky part for everyone is you don't want to be either the office happy, happy, always happy Pollyanna girl, and you don't want to be the office Debbie Downer. The best approach is somewhere in between Debbie Downer and Pollyanna. You stay as positive and hopeful and optimistic as possible while you're also staying in reality. This approach re-energizes your team along the way and helps re-energize you as well. When you're optimistic, you tend to feel more compassionate toward yourself and others. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, to many of you about that bounded optimism. Many people have this middle ground approach as their superpower and do this for a living. And you are the experts at your organization at demonstrating this well to all levels of your team, even on your less than fabulous, super amazing days. Now here are a few fancy bar graphs for any of you who like fancy bar graphs and numbers. Last week, we asked all of our EAP customers what challenges they have seen this past year due to the coronavirus. Their answers covered a wide range of issues, and here are the top five challenges they reported. 65% said they have seen employees be afraid to come to work and their families afraid for them as well. 54% said they had seen employee mental health concerns. Half said they'd seen issues with employee morale and half said they'd seen issues with childcare issues for working parents, and half saw challenges due to, re due to a reduction in incoming revenue to their employer. And here are the next five challenges they mentioned. Just under half, 48%, said they'd seen employee burnout. 48% also said they'd seen challenges due to employees or their family members being diagnosed with COVID. One third said they had experienced employee layoffs or furloughs. 30% said they had experienced difficulty staying connected with their employees. And 18% saw a decrease in productivity due to remote work. And the surprising result to me was that one business said they had seen no challenges whatsoever due to the coronavirus this past year. I'm not sure what to make of this, but how lucky they are. We asked our clients what mental health concerns they had seen over the past year due to the coronavirus. The number one answer was anxiety and panic, reported by 64% of our customers. 41% said they ch saw challenging family relationships. 28% saw depression. The lucky green bar here is for those 21% of our customers who said they saw no increased mental health concerns. 13% said they saw problematic romantic relationships, 5% saw domestic violence, 3% saw substance abuse, and 3% saw feelings of suicide. I'm going to go over the top five, I'm sorry, top six mental health concerns we have been responding to. Research shows that nearly a third of Americans have reported symptoms of anxiety and depression this past year, and that's up 200% from the, before the pandemic. Keep in mind that it's not just the trauma of the pandemic impacting people, but a lot of people can trace their mental health concerns back to the direct viral effects of the coronavirus. Over 28,000 Hawaii citizens have had the virus and survived. Over 29 million Americans and over 120 million globally. Many of these people have some serious complications along the way that have or will impact their mental health. So here's the first mental health issue I'll re review, anxiety. We started off this pandemic helping people with the anxiety and fear people were feeling about the virus. We had a lot of people call in for this specific issue and we helped a lot of employees deal with their fears. Again, this was the number one mental health issue that our survey respondents said they saw due to the coronavirus. It makes sense. We should be afraid of something that could kill us. So a certain amount of fear is appropriate. And it's what makes us do the right thing. We wash our hands, we wear a mask, we stay six feet away. 
However, some people saw their fears rise too high into anxiety or panic. There are a lot of people with a pre-existing anxiety condition who manage it well most of the time, and the coronavirus pushed a lot of these people outside their comfort zone. Chronic uncertainty can create chronic stress. Getting these people some help has been important to keeping them functional and employed and getting through this. The second mental health condition we are seeing in our EAP clients is trauma and early signs of PTSD. Some people have felt traumatized every single day through this past year. Some people are on the front lines and deal with trauma every single day they work. For a lot of people, this past year has been one big traumatic event filled with a lot of little traumas inside of it. One thing you might know about is that if you're dealing with the survivor of previous trauma, like childhood trauma or disasters or illnesses or combat, or if the person is a recovering alcoholic or addict or living with one, or has recently experienced another death or a loss, you might find that they are dealing with this trauma of this pandemic differently. So when you see an employee get hit sideways or unexpectedly hard by this or other events, in addition to getting them to EAP, keep in mind that they may have a backstory. There may be a reason this is hitting them sideways. Keep your radar going for those employees who may not be acting as you thought they would and consider whether there might be more going on in their history or their life that may make them respond differently. Survivors may need additional support to deal with the stress and anxiety of this pandemic. We saw a lot of people this past year who came in because someone in their company suggested they come to see us. So if you recommended EAP to a coworker last year, pat yourselves on the back for getting your traumatized people additional support. And you only see post-trauma after the disaster. Some people, especially in healthcare, are still in the middle of the disaster and we won't be seeing PTSD cases over the next couple until the next couple years as people get some distance from the disaster and figure out they're just not the same. Depression is the third mental health condition we're seeing more of and with greater intensity than usual. People are feeling isolated, lonely, and not able to do the usual things that lift them out of depression, exercise, time with supportive friends or family, or even hanging out with coworkers. This ranges from people just feeling down all the way to feeling suicidal. The earlier you can get people in for help, the better. So please continue reminding anyone who's feeling down to their EAP. And if they mention the word depression, whether it's depression with a small D or a capital D, keep in mind that it's a very treatable disease. Get them to EAP, get them to their doctor. Let people know that there are a lot of people who find ways to treat their depression. And if someone mentions suicide, call EAP immediately. Don't send them home, call your EAP. Grief is the fourth mental health issue. Most of us know about the cycle of grieving that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross developed. Denial, anger, depression, bargaining, and acceptance. And it doesn't take a death to go through these stages. A year ago, we had to decide whether we were all going to work from home. We went through all of these stages. We all started off by saying, no, we're essential employees. We've always done it this way. We have to be there for people. And then um, it'll be fun working from home. That's called denial. Then we went into anger. I had to find IT solutions for our crew to work from home and that's definitely not my strength. The tech wasn't working. Our IT guy didn't fix everything. We had to figure out how to do Zoom calls and Teams calls and get our webcams and microphones working. Then after a month, we hit depression while working from home. This is never going to end. I have no power over the refrigerator. Why bother shaving or showering? Then we started bargaining. Well, what if we only go in for half a day and stay away from people? Or, you know, this person really needs somebody face to face. Maybe we should break the rules or bend them a little bit. And then finally, well, I guess we're all in this together and we're doing this into the acceptance stage. To keep us all safe, many of us are still working from home and making the best of it. And it's manageable after all. Acceptance doesn't mean, yay, we're working from home, but it means we're moving forward. And that was only one grief event. We're all grieving so many other losses and changes, and we're in various stages of this all the time. 
our EAP clients have had lots of losses from little small losses that hurt like paper cuts to people with a lot of paper cuts that are just hurting all the time. And we've been seeing people who are grieving big things due to the pandemic, loved ones they have lost or loved ones they lost who they couldn't say goodbye to before they died because of COVID. We've seen people who are grieving the loss of their job or their company or their industry and we're co all collectively grieving the deaths of half a million people in the U.S. alone. And again, none of us can wrap our heads around that. It's just too big. And for many of us, the recovery process is not a smooth process and a curve after all, especially when we're grieving the loss of so many things we used to take for granted. Some of this collective grief may not hit people for a while. The misuse of drugs or alcohol is something that we in the EAP field are really watching and tracking and concerned about. Research has shown that more people, especially in certain groups, are drinking alcohol during the workday. It's easier when you're home. It's a great way to not feel your feelings, your feelings, your fears, your concerns, or your grief or your stress, but it's not a great way because it's not a great long-term solution. I think we'll be seeing more people violating their drug and alcohol policies over the next few years. More people whose substance abuse turns into an addictive process, more relationships that end due to this issue, and more work-related problems due to substance abuse. So when you see a concern in this area, get these people to EAP. It used to be that some people developed agoraphobia, the fear of being outside your home, for no apparent reason. Now we've drilled into everyone the dangers of being outside your home. It could kill you. Some people take this to extreme and have be become so embedded at home that the thought of going to food land or going to work causes them extreme stress to the point they call in sick or they quit their job or they try to go on disability or family medical leave. EAP counselors can help people with this level of crippling fear and anxiety. Mental, is mental health issues are challenging. The image that appeared in my inbox reminded me to share with you that although it's challenging to work when you have mental health issues, people are stronger than most people think. They cope with these challenges every day. The more you can normalize these mental health issues as just everyday issues, the better your team will be. When someone comes to you and complains about the impact of someone's mental illness in the workforce, you have a choice. You can either join, join in the groaning and the moaning about how challenging it is to deal with someone with a mental illness, or once in a while, when you're on top of your game, you can claim your leadership superpower and say something like, yeah, a lot of our workers are dealing with challenges the best they can. We have employees going through chemotherapy or struggling with diabetes and working here. We have employees who are struggling through divorces and family challenges you have no idea about. One fourth of our employees have a major mental health challenge every year, and it's something that we're used to. Let's talk about how we can deal with this challenge well. So you don't minimize people's feelings about their coworkers' challenges that impact them, but you don't join in and you give them clear perspectives instead. And you support those with mental health challenges just like you would support anyone with other health challenges. And if you are the champion for normalizing mental health challenges and normalizing and destigmatizing seeking help, there might not be a champion and more people will suffer from untreated mental illness. I've added a seventh new category of challenges. It's not an official diagnosis yet, but certainly something we're seeing every day. And it's predicted that this is only going to get worse, COVID fatigue or pandemic fatigue. Here's a recent quote from the Senior Director of Thought Leadership, isn't that a great title, of the National Safety Council. He said, pandemic fatigue is very real and has been for a number of months, both in the workplace and outside of it. Personal stressors and work stressors often compound one another, and after a challenging year, it's understandable why some workers and employers may be falling behind on or getting distracted when it comes to adherence to proper pandemic protocols. And here's another quote last week from the senior risk control manager, not a job title I want, of the Safety National Casualty Corporation. He said, leadership is having a much more challenging time. Over the next month, it is going to get much, much harder. Everyone is getting fatigued. 
these experts and more are talking about people getting tired of wearing masks, tired of social distancing, tired of washing their hands, tired in general. Cumulative fatigue isn't dramatic. What we're going to see is that people get tired and things start to slip because they're fatigued. And it's hard to recognize fatigue when you're fatigued as it's subtle. We all start snapping at each other, being less courteous of each other, not wearing our masks correctly or at all because we're tired and just want things to change. We started off a year ago saying we can do this and a year later things are different. Sorry about the second image here. I had to blur out the raised middle finger because it wasn't appropriate for a professional audience. I'm sure as a professional, you've never seen an upright middle finger, so you may not have even noticed. But people are getting tired and cranky. More masks are down. It's turning more into, I'm fine, leave me alone. Or why bother wearing a mask? I got my vaccine. This is a heads up about a growing safety issue that may start to impact your, your company and become more of a compliance issue for all companies over the next few months. When safety issues on masks start coming up in your organization, maybe you can weigh in and say, hey, that's called pandemic fatigue. Let's address this and come up with a strategy that works to keep everyone safe and address the burnout people are feeling. Your input could not only help people, but help the company's bottom line. All of these mental health conditions and pandemic fatigue seem to come together in a magical word we all know, which is stress. We ask our customers, and most of our points of contact are HR professionals, on a 0 to 10 scale, how stressed they have been over the past year and how stressed their employees have been over the past year. The good news is the results are similar and that everyone started off below the midpoint. Everyone then raised to significantly higher levels of stress three to months into the pandemic. And now, one year later, everyone's stress seems to be decreasing, but certainly not to the point it was a year ago. As you can imagine, there was a lot of individual variation here. Some of our company contact people have felt relatively calm as they see their employees' stress. Some have been more stressed than their employees. Some have gotten more stressed over time, some less stressed over time. The curve really depends on your industry, your organizational culture, the changes going on, the type of employees you work with, as well as your own personality. There's no right or wrong curve, but I think it's a worthy exercise to think about or track how you have been doing this past year and to take a look at how the people you work with are doing. Ask yourself on that same one to 10 scale where your stress has been trending over this past year and compare that with how you see that your employees or your coworkers are doing. I invite you to take a minute to think about what your graph looks like or draw it out. You could even pause the video here and draw it out if you'd like. And just don't take a Sharpie to your computer monitor and draw the lines there, please. Now that we've all survived one year of COVID, I invite you to dust off that crystal ball or those tarot cards or that magic eight ball and guess what's ahead for year two. Take a breath, pat yourself on the back for surviving, and think for a moment about what you think the next year will bring. Will it be easier or more challenging? Will we be more stressed a year from now, less stressed, or the same level of stress? We asked our customers what they thought next year would bring. And here's what they came up with. The most popular response came from a little over 42% of them who are guessing that things will be just as stressful next year as they are now. 27.5% of them are guessing that things will be less stressful a year from now. And I hope they're right. We do have a positive track record as a people and as a culture of growth and resilience. Most of us did survive and that changes things. We have learned things along the way that might help us move forward with increased strength. Are these people Pollyannas? Do they know something we don't? Who knows, but maybe this is bounded optimism. We will see a year from now whether they were right. And 30% of our customers are guessing that things will be more stressful a year from now. Half of them believe that things will be more stressful due to new challenges ahead this next year. And the other half are guessing that not only will be, we be dealing with new challenges this next year, but burnout. 
there are some factors if I tie on my Debbie Downer helmet that contribute to the belief that this next year may be rougher. Many are feeling burnt out. Mental health issues take time to show. The addictive process can take years to become overt. A lot of people don't make big family or marital changes during a crisis. They wait till after the crisis has subsided. The cumulative trauma and grief may start catching up to people. And we don't know how long the vaccine will last. So the jury's out. The numbers are pretty well divided between those who think we'll be the same or better by this time next year and those who think we'll be the same or more stressed. Watch that battle around you between the Pollyannas and the Debbie Downers and be careful about strapping on either your Pollyanna bonnet or your Debbie Downer helmet. I want to spend a few minutes talking about less fancy charts and graphs and more into the realities we're seeing as people are working from home myself included. I'm working from home today doing this webinar hoping that my next door neighbors who have been doing construction this past week aren't ripping out another wall today. And I'm hoping that Spectrum doesn't pull the plug on our internet as they have every couple days. Some of the many joys of working from home. Our EAP has responded to a lot of different issues that have been triggered because people are now working from home. There are just so many distractions especially for parents who are dealing with kids going to school a few feet away. They just have so many adjustments and challenges that I couldn't imagine. I'm distracted working a few feet away from the refrigerator, and that's bad enough. And for me, there's nothing more festive than the FedEx delivery person knocking on the door and inciting our dachshund to attempted violence, always during a Zoom call. Um, home renovation to the right and to the left. Um, everyone's shopping at Home Depot and Lowe's and City Mill these, these days trying to change what we can change. And limited internet bandwidth with two or more people trying to do a Zoom call at the same time. Of course there have always been distractions at the office as well, but it's taken some time for most of us to adjust to these new distractions trying to juggle our work life with our home life. And here's something new, endless Zoom fatigue from endless back-to-back -back meetings. Um, I, you know, some people do this for eight hours a day. Um, my mental health Zoom tip for the day is to schedule your Zoom meetings as often as, as possible for 45 minutes, not an hour. So you give yourself and you, you, the other people a chance to stand, to stretch, to use the restroom. This is really an area where advocacy can shine. If you help your company give people more breaks between Zoom meetings and people find out it was you who made this happen, they will be throwing you a parade someday or at least bringing you a nice warm malasada or something. It's been hard for many people to set good boundaries with their children or spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend or pets or coworkers or even their bosses who are emailing them at 10 p.m. Kids have even had to set good boundaries with their parents as well. Couples and families are struggling with who does what share of the housework with everybody working from home. So that's been fun for a lot of families. Families have had to communicate more about chores and schedules and dishes and privacy and Zoom conversations. And it has just changed dynamics in a lot of families. The good news is that we work with a lot of families who have just grown amazingly during, these, during these, this past year. They've worked out these details. They've come to respect and understand each other more. They get along better than they once did. And unfortunately, the flip side of this is there have been huge unresolvable challenges created in other families. There have been more domestic violence reports as a result of people locked down with their abuser. So it's been challenging for a lot of people. One boundary issue has been reported on globally, and that's been the more people, and I was surprised to see that research has found this is especially the case with women, are drinking alcohol during work hours than ever before. This may be one of those tip of the iceberg issues that once people start coming back to work again, you'll be seeing more impairment on the job. Our counselors, along with national statistics, are predicting that we are just now seeing the beginning of a larger swing of people who are getting through the pandemic by self-medicating with drugs or alcohol. Working from home has made some people be more thoughtful of their choices, like wearing pants during a Zoom meeting, 
Some people are doing well, some people not so much. Some are being referred to us as a supervisor referral because of some bad decisions they've made, even during a Zoom call. Um, this is on the range from anywhere from silly to criminal. You may have seen social media posts about the people who have used the bathroom during a Zoom meeting. Um, here in Hawaii, we've, we've had people showing porn during a business Zoom meeting. That's one more fun thing for a company to figure out how to deal with. Aren't they lucky? And it's been hard for a lot of people who are feeling the impact of social isolation. Loneliness is up. I've had friends and colleagues, especially single ones, move from Hawaii to the mainland because they just aren't in anyone's bubble. They're feeling no human connection at all. We've had a number of referrals for just that issue. A lot of people are turning to a counselor for support as that's the only relatively sane person in their life that can support them. Some people are relieved at the social distance. You're introverts. They're doing fine. Some people are just devastated. Depression is up, loneliness, isolation, and boredom. And people are reaching out for support for this issue as never before. In light of all the challenges, we wanted to know from our customers whether they have been leveraging EAP differently this past year. We asked them whether in light of the coronavirus crisis they are using EAP products or services differently, and most said they had. 85% said they are promoting EAP more to employees by reminding them more about their EAP benefit. 68% said they distributed more newsletters to employees, and 40% said they distributed more supervisor newsletters. 45% also said they posted more flyers, posters, and materials that we sent out, and 28% said they distributed more flyers. 8% said they called us more for supervisor referrals last year. 5% said they called more for substance abuse and mental health issues, as well as for management and HR consultation. And 8% said there were no changes last year in how they used EAP. So in light of the inc increasing mental health challenges we're seeing, it was great to see that most of our customers were making an increased effort at reaching out to their employees and promoting they seek assistance if they needed it. We also, help, we also asked our EAP customers if their EAP had been helpful to them personally this past year, and here are the comments they shared. That we're a great res resource of information and advice, that we're available, the emails, the newsletters that we help, we're supportive, dependable, um, advice, newsletters, it's able to help me talk through some issues. Next slide is just knowing that we're there, has been reassuring, um, we're a valuable resource available to employees, current information, reading materials, being available, we reached out, uh, and knowing that I can confidently recommend the EAP to our employees and managers for support gives me peace of mind. So after a challenging year, it was great to hear that our customers felt and appreciated our personal support this past year. And we asked our customers if the EAP had been helpful to their organization this past year. And here are the comments they shared. Uh, we helped with their employee communications platform. They didn't have to make any referrals, but they're all, we're always available, available, a source of support. Uh, emails, newsletters, information distribution is a great help. Monthly flyers are helpful. Page two here, uh, they appreciate our identity theft resources because of the fraudulent unemployment claims, the referrals and newsletters and consultation resources, availability, helpful hints, it's a great service, and being able to re refer employees who are struggling. So again, it was reassuring to hear that after a challenging year, our EAP customers still valued our services. This was a tough year for our business as well. We all started the year seeing companies and industries shut down and we were worried about how this would impact our business. Fortunately, that didn't have much of an issue on our bottom line and we became more visible to most companies who saw the struggles their employees were going through. In response to the pandemic, like most businesses, we made a lot of changes over the year and I'll review a few of them in a minute. This past year, I have seen EAPs either solidify their support of their corporate customers by stepping up their services or EAPs that dropped customers on their heads. We're extremely thankful for the strong partnerships we have developed with over 200 corporate customers and we appreciate their support. 
We appreciate the CARES Act and PPP funding we got, uh, and just the amazingly hard work of our EAP crew who really went above and beyond this, this past year. In addition to retaining most of our valuable customers, we even gained a few important new customers because they saw an increased need for EAP support. We've continued to grow the services we are able to offer our customers, and yes, we have our heads sufficiently above water. We're feeling quite a bit of re relief after one pandemic year that we survived intact. We're doing well a year later, but as I said at the beginning, it's been a heck of a year that's involved a lot of changes. Uh, our counseling benefit, the one that most people know about, changed significantly this past year. We have offered telehealth for years, but nobody ever took advantage of it. Now it's what we're doing 99% of the time. And I want to reassure you that serving Hawaii employees and their family members through telephone sessions or secure video connections has really worked out well for most people. People are reaching out for help, and most are finding that telehealth is just more convenient. Instead of taking off a half an hour to drive to the counseling appointment, an hour for counseling, and then a half an hour to drive back, so two hours for one hour of counseling, people are doing an hour in a car during their lunch break for a counseling appointment, uh, and families or couples are Zooming together for and using this technology, and it's really working well. At some point, we'll be going back to much more face-to-face -face counseling again, but I'm guessing that telehealth is just here to stay as a viable mode of service delivery. We've offered these three work-life services for several years, a free half hour with an attorney for non-work-related matters, a free half hour with a financial expert, and an hour or two with a local company, Ho'o Kelly Healthcare Navigators, to deal with elder care or caregiver or kapuna issues. This past year, we added two new benefits. The first is a free half hour with a local Hawaii mediation center so that employees can settle more of their issues in a positive manner. Seeing a mediator and using their low cost neutral services instead of duking it out in court and paying two attorneys can save employees thousands of dollars. Whether it's resolving divorce or parenting issues or landlord tenant issues or other issues, mediation is just a great tool. My wife and I are both certified mediators, so we both know firsthand the advantages of helping get people to this resource. So we're especially thrilled to help more people across the state use these resources. And the other new benefit that's been surprisingly popular given the rampant unemployment fraud going on is our identity theft benefit. Employees hit by credit card fraud or identity theft can now access an hour with an expert that can help them get back on the right track. And for most of our customers who pay us per employee per year, these are two new additional services that we pay for that they don't. Adding two new free benefits was a fun way of giving back this past year. And we've also added a whole new section to our website with coronavirus resources that include some online video trainings like this one that have evolved over the past year. Also included were articles and handouts on a variety of COVID related topics and dozens of website links for working from home tips, uh, COVID and mental health tips, relationships, kids, online 12 step meeting links and more. And again, these kept evolving over the year and still are as the issues change. As our clients mentioned, we gave them a ton of materials this past year to help them promote our services. We changed our Hawaii-based written, Hawaii written employee newsletter from quarterly to monthly to give people more support. Most of the questions and the answers in our supervisor newsletter had to do with how to deal with issues around the coronavirus. We created and distributed a slew of downloadable flyers on managing fear, helping your immune system fight the virus, information on furloughs and layoffs, self-care practices and tips, suicide prevention, tips for developing resiliency, and just much more. I was worried that we were pestering our clients with too much information, but they seemed to appreciate our tsunami of tips and tools this past year. We also changed our approach from encouraging self-care to promoting what we call extreme self-care. And this approach just resonated with a lot of people. To avoid going down the COVID rabbit hole, 
taking a deeper dive into self-care has never been more important. We changed our approach from wellness to well-being, aligning with Gallup's five pillars of well-being, purpose, social, financial, community, and physical. The more we can support employees with these five aspects of well-being, the better they will do. My wife and business partner's book, 52 Weeks of Well-Being, is available on our homepage free of charge. We email out to everyone who subscribes one well-being tip a year, along with quotes and an art or writing project every week for an entire year. And hundreds of people are taking advantage of this. We even have teams and businesses who are working together on each page one week at a time for this past year as a team well-being exercise. So if you haven't signed up, feel free to sign up on our homepage, even if you're not one of our customers. It's a free book. You can't beat that. Much of the goal of our counseling and our work life services and our newsletters and information this past year shifted to what we call fighting the emotional erosion of this pandemic. Along with our HR partners in the 200 companies we serve, we work every day to stabilize what's being torn away, building up people and stabilizing companies that have been impacted by this global pandemic. We appreciate that you trust us enough to refer some of your troubled employees to us so we can help support them, their families, and their livelihood. We appreciate all the employees who have overcome fears and obstacles and have found ways to successfully keep things together this past year. We also appreciate that we've seen brilliant and thoughtful and compassionate Hawaii-based companies and leaders do incredible things this past year to help stabilize people and families and companies. Working together to shore up Hawaii's people just truly makes a difference every day. And a final reminder for all of you is to know when to call for support. EAP is a resource that's available 24-7, and we encourage you to use your EAP resources when you need it. I believe our local EAP team is a great support that helps make challenging jobs and life situations a bit less challenging. And if we're not your EAP, here's the commercial. I'd be happy to talk with you about changing that. Give me a call and we can have a Zoom meeting. So finally, on behalf of our EAP staff and our team of 75 counselors across the state, mahalo for your time today. If we can help, don't hesitate to give us a call or log on to our website and reach out to us that way. Remember that your EAP is a free and confidential resource for you and your family, and we're available 24-7. Mahalo for your time. Congratulations on surviving year one of the coronavirus pandemic and take care as we all move forward into year two. Mahalo.